do you think this is God's fault? Like, how how do you theolo theologize this this tragedy? So, so to put it shortly, like I'm not a um, I'm not a Calvinist for okay. one. So, like I I look in and I go, no, this is not God. This was not ordained by God. And I, I kind of spell out my reasons in the book why. Um, I don't feel it was ordained by God. I don't feel it was a punishment from God. Um, I don't think it was a greater good idea either. I think there's evil, there's an imperfect world, and life will happen. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to the Christ and Coffee Podcast. My name is Dr. Hai Kerlopian, and our mission here is simple. We want to unite Christians one conversation at a time. Rip Wahlberg joins today's conversation to talk about his book, Shattered, Surviving and Thriving After the Worst Pains of Life. He talks about what it was like for him and his family when he lost his four and a half year old son, Aiden and how he processed the pain, how he dealt with it, and how he was able to just accept the realities of losing a son. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. Uh, he wrote this book a decade after it took place, and he offers a lot of insights for us all who may be dealing with various types of pain. So with that said, please grab a cup of coffee and enjoy this Christ-centered conversation. <laughs> Hey Rip, so good to see you, my friend. Hey, hi, how you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. It's it's. Uh, I love this podcast because you get to catch up with old friends. And I remember when we first met, I was just starting out in ministry, and uh, you were equipping me in, in some of the vineyard style of ministry. So it was really, it's really cool to, to stay in touch after all these years. Yeah, absolutely. I feel the same way, and that actually is a little new to me. You you were newer to ministry then. Um, I mean, I was like newer. I kind of like was like a professional minister at that point. Like I got ordained. Yeah. I just got ordained, I think, when we first met or like a year okay. into, or a year or two into getting ordained. Well, you seemed quite seasoned to me. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, for what yeah. that's worth. No, I got my gained. call. I got my call in the ministry in college. So I was like doing the ministry, but, uh -huh. you know, just but it was more like youth ministries, this and that, but not like as a pastor of a church uh, yeah, sort yeah. Of position. Well, jumping through the hoops to get that rev status, as they say. That's right. That's that right. means nothing, really. <laughs> I, know, I know. That anyone it's... could get whenever they're like online, like, oh, my friend wants me to officiate a wedding. I'll go to joeschmoseseminary.com. Look at me. I could officiate weddings now. So it, exactly. it really doesn't mean as much as it used to, sadly. Yeah, that uh, is a little sad because there's this. I mean, we both understand what, what that would be. And it's the it recognizes the hand of God on someone that God has set you apart for a specific and and beautiful task of serving him and others and now it's kind of been watered down a bit yeah yeah it's but, gotten it's gotten to the point where i'm just like branding myself as dr high because of the weight to that huh okay. but like but i would prefer to be like a reverend but it's just you know there's like some just reverend is also kind of like us it's kind of like up there a little bit with your like, yeah. Look at me, I'm all reverent. <laughs> but, but, I, but there has it. been this kind of trend of like not having the the reverency to the post, which I think has been 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 more of a detriment overall. Yeah. I think. Yeah, maybe I can get to the point where I'll just brand myself as Rip Wahlberg MTS because I won't have the I won't have the doctors yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just I'm just playing. I'm playing. But I think that's number one. Doctor Hyg is fun. Um, yeah. and, and it does have its own cachet, let's say, right. Which is, I think is a good thing. Right. Know? Right. I, but at the end of the day, it's like, I just want to serve <laughs> titles. Don't oh, mean much, but if they help, if they help people like gain credibility, then I mm -hmm. think it's important, because especially nowadays where anyone could just get on the internet, act like an expert, but are they <laughs> like, did they right. really put in the work? Did they really put in the hours? Did they really go to the schools? Yep. Uh, so I guess it's important just to take advantage of it if you, um, and just, you know, own it. How can, yeah, own it. And how can you put it to use? Like in, in my Hebrew class, one of the things that was so interesting was, um, and from Alliance, um, the, the professor said, we were talking about all the credentials and stuff. And he goes, you know, your PhD, let's say is, or, you know, demon and whatever you have, he goes, 
it's really the beginning. It's not the it's not the end. It's actually supposed to be the beginning. And it was a really good eye opener. Like he was trying to say, you got to that point, but now you actually start is when the time you do something with it, right? Instead of just earning it, right? Yeah, you know? you're a practitioner, and that, that's why the the experience, the credibility of the craft of being a pastor. It's a it's a unique skill set. It's it's yeah. it's very. It's a very beautiful thing that you just continue to grow and develop in. It's never just like, yeah, no, that's a, good, right. a very good point. Yep. Um, I know we kind of jumped into the conversation, but I have to ask all my guests this very important theological question. Yes. Um, it's close. It's like it's up there with the question of the meaning of life. Um, what 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 kind of coffee do you drink? Ah, uh, um, if I want to be, I am not a coffee connoisseur, so I it's very laid back and watered down like meaning um mocha would be kind of like a go-to for me just something that's sweet because i don't do cream in my coffee so it's either mocha or black okay like something that has a, a chocolatey to it or simply black coffee um and uh yeah it's i hear of people that that really love their coffee and they know all kinds of stuff about it they know the roast they know the times they all that um, and they get pretty unique about it. So, um, the farthest, the, the farthest I get is put a little splash of mocha in it or something. Nice. It's chocolate. Yeah. Do you, are you like a morning drinker or it's more like a dessert after a meal? Yeah, actually it's morning. It's just morning and that's it. Okay. I, I like cold ice after that of everything for the rest of the day. Um, and even at night, like I, I know my wife loves tea and people like warm drinks at night. And I'm like, no, just keep it cold. So, yeah. That's great. How about you? Um, I'm I'm pretty much a black drinker. Um, okay. I dr like iced Americanos are kind of my go-to in the mornings because I got this like machine that kind of is like almost an espresso machine, kind of uh -huh. splurge, but like did the math, like it saves me a lot of money <laughs> oh, yeah. in a year. Right. Uh, right. So I, I, I'm doing the iced uh, Americano to wake up. And then okay. usually, like right, bef like after lunch or right before the the mid noon, I do another cup, and that's usually at a coffee shop or or here if I'm working from home. Okay. Um, so I usually get like two things, but I'm trying not to drink caffeine after one because yeah. then I stay up jittery, and I realize that that has a huge impact on on sleep cycles. So I, I, that that's been really helpful, just doing some of the research to just oh, make yeah. sure like my last cup is at one. I don't always follow that rule. But um, I try my best. But I'm usually like a two cup a day, and I like it black, uh, whether okay. it's hot or cold. Um, ice pour over is like a it's like a weird thing that I really like when it's done well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, I think uh, nice. I'm getting to the snobbery point of like Starbucks is like not making me like the opposite it makes me tired and angry if i drink starbucks oh wow <laughs> so like it, it's bad wow. getting to that point like it, it's kind of like you hit you've, you've evolved to the next level of snobbery i think <laughs> so back in the city did you what was um what was that place along the water and it used to be an old market or whatever and there was like this mega starbucks um in there yeah so chelsea market there's this uh a, like fancy Starbucks where they have like pizzas and they have like like cocktail coffee drinks like a bar, full on bar. I forget right. the name of it. It's like the Starbucks Reserve, something like that. But yeah, it's a full it, on right, restaurant yeah. building. So um, like, yeah, can you a, do, is that a nut? Is that like on the scale that you like? Oh, that's more like it's more like a gimmick in the sense of like. Um, oh, it's a nice, it's it's a cool experience to go to it. Uh, but okay. it's that's more for like Starbucks with the like merchandise branding uh right. there's like a bar there's a bar where they serve alcoholic drinks but with coffee stuff oh, i don't know there. if i saw that one I, we were there my, with my family and stuff one time but yeah yeah, yeah. there's a anyway. bar up top there's a roastery yeah it's, it's it's cool experience i think there's also one in seattle but i don't know if there's any other ones but yeah it's quite quite yeah. remarkable Neat. um so just to jump gears you you just completed writing this book called shattered yes so when, yep. what what what's the premise when 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 did you when did you write it you just released it recently or so it released in October okay. uh, mid October or so last year and the premise is it's a it it's a three part book the first part is I'm writing about the the story of the loss of our son fifteen no more than fifteen years ago um, in two thousand six he our four year old son Aiden. 
uh, drown in a sudden accident at a, at a friend's pool back in Connecticut. And so I want to share not just the journey, but I want to share how do we let God into our pain? And so I, I also go through like the first part of the book is, is like the story through the first year. Here's as raw as it is. Here's how, what we had to face. Here's what was hard for us and, and what it was like as best. I, I don't pull punches. I don't really candy coat it. Uh, I want people to feel it because I'm, my hope is that if I can share my stuff and you've been hiding your stuff and not addressing it, then perhaps it'll inspire you to go to God and let God, as I say, touch our wounds. So I, I take the second part of the book and I share a number of things that we do to avoid the pain of any pains of life. I don't try to narrow it into just the loss of a child. That's just our story. But the what are the things that are the pains in another person's life that are important to them? Because I contend that they're just as important to God, right? Not, not because mine seem is seemingly more or harder and more difficult. No, everybody's stuff is important to them, and God wants to heal that stuff. So I go through certain things we can do with religion. You know, we tell truths to pain instead of let people have the pain. We not only do we inebriate with alcohol or other things, we we get busy and we we stay distracted. We um, we tell people Bible truths, uh, which is sort of truth to pain. But all these little things we do, uh, we that that actually keep us from knowing God's goodness and experiencing Him in the midst of that. And then I try to do some. Uh, I, I share some theology, some proverbs, some Job, and so forth. And then the third part of the book is testimonies of other people and also like, where is our family now? We're we're all on a journey in my family, but we're all trying to let God in. And as a result, we haven't walked away from God. We actually are. We continued as a family to walk toward him. And we're so my premise is there's hope to survive and thrive after the worst pains of life if we let God touch our wounds. Wow. Wow. So yeah. you you had a four year old, yes, um, and uh, he was just out of friends, uh, family members. Your family is just out and about. So my wife took our five kids at the time uh, up back up to Connecticut. We live in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We were from Connecticut. Two years after we moved here, she took a trip with them right after school ended, took them back up to Connecticut. She was going to make a whirlwind kind of trip to see a bunch of friends and people there. And she was spending the afternoon at some very close friends of ours at their house. Uh, and they had a pool and everyone was there and he just sort of slipped through their attention. Yeah. And about literally 12, 15 feet away from them, um, just kind of slipped under the radar for a moment and he found his way into the hot tub, thought, oh, this will be fun. And we don't know how, but my guess is that he got into the hot tub and then he may have lost his footing or something. Um, and he got into the middle where you'd put your feet as an adult, but it was obviously too high for him as a four-year-old. Wow. So, um, yeah, it just went from beautiful to chaos and panic in, a, in literally like a, a half a second. Um, yeah, it's so scary. I have a three and a half year old, and then I could, I think every parent who's has a four year old, three year old knows how quick they could just disappear. And yeah, and you, like, how do you, like, did you, like, I can't imagine that pain is what first and foremost. Um, mm -hmm. So is it just a numbing pain? Is it just shock? Is it everyone deals with the, the pain? And you, I mean, you have your it's wife. It's every stage you, of, it's every stage of grief. And I, forgive me for not knowing each one, but I think they might say there's like seven stages. Yeah. They're all nonlinear too. It's not right. one to the next to the next. They come out messy. Like you'll go through, you'll go through shock, then anger, then, you know, some pain and, and back around, you'll circle back and forth. Um, I would, yeah, to be honest, it's, it's hard. It's almost indescribable. So, and the hard part is it's a necessary conversation, I think, because 
like I said, we hide that pain. We hide our own pain. So I figured people have said, yeah, it's the worst thing in life you can experience. Well, maybe I can capitalize on that for other people's benefit. You know, that that if if they do kind of compare that, maybe they'll go, oh, if he could do that, then maybe I could do this. And if God, because I, I really wanted to make God the central focus, that we go to God with these things. Yeah. Um, and he is the healer. Um, and but yeah, it it was it was just such an intense, intense, intense pain. I describe it in the book as like sitting in fire and being burned up without being consumed to ash while your friends look on pitifully, knowing they cannot get you out of it. They're just wow. sitting there watching you burn. Wow. And that's kind of what it was felt like to me in my mind and in my physical body at times. Of course, of course. And it's a I'd say it was seven years before we kind of felt normal again as a family, like the, the six of us, as opposed to the seven of us. And for me, it was probably, or for all of us, it was also probably a total of 11 years before we really felt like we could, we were out of all of it and actually could have enough life to want to put the energy into moving forward. Um, so I find a lot of people that go through what, what we've experienced, we tend to want to write something and write a book or do this stuff. And we want to do it like two years in or four years in. And experientially, my thought is that's actually way too early. You're, You're still right. not able to write from a place of clarity. You're going to write from the place of emotion, uh, which is totally understandable. I just, I, I decided to wait so I could figure out what it was I wanted to say. How could I, organize it and then i'd be writing from a place of like experience versus only the emotion um so hopefully it it kind of hit that nerve but from what people have said and the feedback i get uh, it really seems like it's touched people's lives and and has helped open them up to their own walk with god for that and i so, hope it does so what would you say is um like as a, you're also a pastor, you're, mm -hmm. you, uh, what would be good advice for churches to hear? Like, say, God forbid, something similar happens to someone people know. Someone's in a moment of pain. Yeah. What, as a Christian, as a pastor, what's good advice to do in moments where it seems like there's inespeakable inesp evil that took place? Yeah. For me, the the most pastoral, the most human thing we could do is just be present and actually speak less. So I look at Job's friends and the whole reason that they got into an argument over, you know, a dozen plus two dozen chapters. When you look at the whole story, whole reason they got into an argument was because they kept speak what I call, they kept speaking truth to uh, Job's pain and trying to make sense of it for him. And it became this back and forth. The most compassionate thing we can do is simply be present. even if, And we're not going to have the answers. And just don't try to make up answers. Let, let that person have the pain that they're having. It's going to feel awful, but let them have the pain they're having. And be okay with not having a whole lot of words or answers that because that the tendency is then you want to take them out, help them get out of it and you can't. Yeah. So stay with them in it. Right. Right. They want, you want to get like a quick band aid fix to something that's going to be, like you said, a t 11 year, seven year, 15 yeah. year process. Yeah. To fully, fully and alleviate. You, and you know, it, over the years, it became that, that one point became very much a part of, the ministry that that when I'm doing ministry over someone, I'm praying over them, even if I'm moving between wanting to pray and, you know, even cast out a demon. The, the thing I'm trying to get to first is help them have the emotion that that they're stuck in in that moment, help them connect to it and help them literally purge it out till it's done. That's become a very big component of what I, when I'm ministering like that, uh, what I'll try to do and I'll move back and forth. I'll weave, you know, and, and we're always, it's always fluid. It's not linear, 
but it's become a big part of what I'm trying to do. To be intent, but to be in tune with the emotion. Oh and yeah, think, and I think yeah. like and sometimes religiosity or just social cultural norms, um, they just want to make sure that we, like maybe it's either like emotionalism, right? You could mm -hmm. have like a worship band that's like manipulating right. chords to create this uh fleshly worship experience that's right. not really spiritual. create an atmosphere kind of thing it's yeah not, on the presence one end, of god isn't necessarily there and then on and then on the other end you have like we're only singing positive songs uh happy thoughts yeah no lamentations <laughs> no proper singing of psalms that too only, we all we, it's a church for only positive feelings yes yes and you know what i think god is okay with messy yeah and when he says come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden, right? Like cast your cares on me. Like, and he's okay that it's messy. Look at, I mean, if he was okay with Jacob wrestling with him and yet we just want to be there like nice and stoic and all put together and quiet and contained. And I guess I'm just having to suffer for Jesus when I, I really think life is not always that simply black and white. There's a lot of both and there's a lot of paradigm and tension. And I think God is okay with doing that. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think when it gets messy and he hasn't rejected us, he simply waited and or comforted us. To me, that helps us experience more about him than we may have known about him. Wow. And I think it's valuable. It's that a piece of like, I didn't know you were that kind. I didn't know you would wait till I was done with all this. I didn't know you weren't going to push me through and just come on. I'm in a hurry. I got to get to the next person I'm supposed to help. So would you get over your stuff quicker? Like he's that patient and all of that. I find a revelation of God to be helpful. You, in, your, in your book, you talk about uh, pain becoming an idol. Can you? Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? And what what what, 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 do you, what do you mean by that? So what what pain does is, it's like there's always the truth of God, and I refer to it, and I have the illustrations of the cross. Like the cross is the truth of God, but the pain when we believe our own emotional world, that pain gets in the way, and it it filters and it acts as an idol that gets in front of the cross and it filters our truth. And then we keep having to feed and protect that thing as opposed to be set free and be healed by the truth. So it may be like, I believe if I, if I really let this go, I'm going to, my truth is I'll be punished again. Let's say if I if I just let myself go to the emotion, I'll just be punished for being emotional. And yet the truth of God in the cross is that God's OK with that. And he'll he'll let us he's willing for us to exhaust it, let's say. So so the pain becomes an idol and it blocks the light of God's truth. So instead of so instead of giving the pain to God, we kind of create this shield with the pain. Yeah, and, we, and, and there's it, some spirituality to it, but it's like a false spirituality because it doesn't really connect us to the source of spirituality. Because we were trying to just like put that block to connect to God. Is that is that kind of what you're saying? I would I would say yes, very much so. So like it's it 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 grows up from out of that idea, our emotion, our truth, our emotion. Um, is our truth, but not necessarily the truth. Because if, if I experience something and I come to believe this is true about life, but you would not attest to it. Like you go, like, for example, I used to believe one day I'm going to run out of money and the world's going to cave in on me. I talked to some friends in my church and I was like, do you live life like this? And they're like, nope. <laughs> it was actually healing. Because what it, what I realized was, oh, that's my truth. I'm I'm having to f I keep protecting this thing, but that's not a truth. The truth of life. Oh, I must have this. I I could have this wrong. 
And how do the how do I get along? But I was living in a way that kept fostering and kept feeding truths like that. Um, so yeah, they they have a way of becoming. They cultivate a religiosity in us as well at times. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I think there's some statistic. I don't know the exact figures, but oftentimes when a couple loses a child, there's like a higher divorce rate. Is that? Yeah, I don't know the statistics either, but uh, yes, I've heard that many times, and I agree with you. Yeah. How, how did how were you able to keep your family together, keep your marriage together with such a such a awful awful situation? I was early on. I was actually scared about that. I can still remember sitting at my kitchen table and three nights, two nights in, three nights in, and and everybody gone to bed, and I'm like, my goodness, this could actually tear us apart. That was frightening. But what we did was one of the key things that Anne Marie and I did is that somehow we managed to figure out, let each other go on the journey that they're on. So Anne Marie took a very pregnant way. I call it a pregnant way. She tried very hard to avoid that pain. She extended her time, I think, for years, but I didn't, I don't think I tried to change her about that i you know i'm not the perfect husband and i've done other things but in that i think i gave her the space whatever it was and it was painful to watch sometimes she on the other hand would give me the space like i get up from the kitchen table and i was fine i go to get something by the time i came back a panic attack had set in on me and from laughing when I got up from the table to come back and go, I got to go right now. I'm out. My kids are there. She's there. And I was out the door in three seconds. Got my keys, wallet, gone. And I went over to Aiden's grave. And I just sat there and I cried and cried and cried and cried and cried. I, I Father's Day is uh, hard for me. It's better these days, but it, early, early on, I couldn't I, I couldn't even be around my kids because of this, how our, how the narrative flowed in time. We, we buried Aiden a week after he died and the next day was father's day. So for me in my mind and my soul, this is all tied together. Wow. So I went to Anne Marie first couple of years and I said, I just can't, I need this day totally to myself. And she didn't argue it. She said, I get it. I don't understand it, but you can, that's fine. She said, the only thing I would ask is, can you just give the kids a little time with you? Sure. So the, that's the long descriptive answer. But the short answer is we tried our best to give each other space to go on, be on that journey. Even if we didn't think it was the best things for each other all the time. So you weren't trying to be like Job's friends to each other. Did our best not to. Yeah. Yeah. Some sometimes I I probably opened my mouth a little bit on some details, but overall I'm I'm pretty sure we we did it pretty well. And then and then how did so you have three kids? We have four other children. Yeah. Four other children. Yep. Okay. And and what were their ages when this tragedy happened? Oh, that's a great. I think Blake was eleven. Kaylee I think was nine. Um. Gabe would have been six and Addison would have been two. Wow. Yeah. Addie is the one that's so interesting. We all have memories of Aiden and, and our youngest daughter has zero memories of him. And he was in her face. He would play with her. He would, Aiden would all, he loved Addison so much because uh, he was the next oldest right in front of her. So it was kind of really cool for him, right? But um, she has no memories of him. So her story is unique in its own way. She, she sometimes feel bad, feels bad. I don't have memories. So. Um, right, right. Yeah. But it's still there. It's just, yeah, you can't recall past three, but it's still there. Um, yeah. But yeah. That's, a, that's a quite, quite remarkable. And yep. your family, they're all serving the Lord. They're all together. You're able to we, endure through this. Like, did, yeah, did, did we, your whole family get closer are. to God? Did anyone like question God's like, why did God let this happen? Um, so, yeah. So like, I would say 
Um, Blake, uh, as far as the kids go, I mean, I kind of told my story about it. Anne Marie has has actually gotten a lot of um, healing. She she no longer feels, and God did definitively heal her of like guilt of it was my fault kind of thing. So that that does not trouble her now, which I praise God for. But uh, Blake has had different things. He went on his own journey about it. He never fully walked away from God, but he was holding back on addressing this stuff about Aiden. So he has been addressing it in the last couple of years and, and other stuff. And it really has, um, like his wife would say, you are not the same person from, you know, even two years ago till now. Um, and Kaylee is start has been, I think, addressing some things. And I think my son Gabe is probably on his way to starting to like, let God into stuff. Thankfully, though, we've all never, I would say we never walked away from faith. We never walked away from um, professing Jesus. Everybody's going to kind of go on their own journey, and I'm not trying to candy coat that at all, but everyone will go on their own journey how they're going to walk that out. But they've never really, they've never completely turned their back on God, um, which I'm really, really grateful for. And, and they're, they're all walking toward him in different degrees, again, which I'm very grateful for, because I think that's better than I just don't give a damn, let's say. Right, right, right. No, because I've seen it. I think it's like whenever something tragic happens, it either draws people closer to God or they just want nothing to do with God. Um, yeah. And then it's, but it's quite a remarkable, remarkable testimony in of itself that this evil thing happened we're still you know we're still together we still love god i mean of course it, 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 addressing it will be different especially if you're still growing up you could have to do it later in life i guess right it makes sense yep. to me um but but that's quite quite remarkable so w w w let's like jump to the theology i think it's always weird to talk about the problem of evil when yeah. you're in the midst of it but like sure. you know 15 years you wrote a book do you think this is God's fault? Like, how how do you theolo theologize this this tragedy? So, so to put it shortly, like, I'm not a um, I'm not a Calvinist for okay. one. So, like, I I look in and I go, no, this is not God. This was not ordained by God. And I I kind of spell out my reasons in the book why. Um, I don't feel it was ordained by God. I don't feel it was a punishment from God. Um, I don't think it was a greater good idea either. I think there's evil, there's an imperfect world, and life will happen. And from what I take away from the book of Job now is not how to suffer for God, because I think that's what we impose onto the book of Job, for example. What I take away from the book of Job is, I agree with John Walton on this, Job is written to show us how to see God in the midst of the imperfections of life. And so that's where I, that's kind of where I land on it. I, I really never went through a time of blame God. And I was cautious about asking why. I probably overdid the ask, don't ask why. Because I think God's actually okay if we ask why. But I think um, God because why can be, I want to come close to you. It can be that as opposed to I'm shaking my fist at you and I'm going to turn my back and walk, you know, turn on my heels and go. Um, so why is actually okay. I think there are other things too, like that I learned theologically, I'd say. You look at Proverbs 25, 20, and it says, whoever sings songs to uh, um, a I'll say a broken heart. He who sings songs to a, a broken heart is like one who puts is like salt on vinegar and one who takes off a cloak on a, on a cold day. And what's interesting is basically that's the, to me, that's the truth to pain. When we, when we're telling someone truths in the midst of their pain, we're making their situation worse. 
And I think it actually said, it, I don't think it's overstating that we're abusing someone when we do that. Um, we're, we're harming them, not helping them. By, by just speaking very truthfully on situations, like, can you elaborate a bit more on, like, what's an example of that? So an example is this, <clears throat> I get introduced to someone, I've had, the, I had this happen. I get introduced to someone, a pastor, and he didn't know what to say. Oh, you remember this guy from three weeks ago? Here he is in the flesh. And the guy was genuine, good heart, but he just went, he had, he didn't know what to say. And he just said, I have no words except God knows what it's like to lose a son too. Right. And in my situation right there, I just went in my head. I had to say, I had to say thank you out loud, but inside I'm going, are you kidding me? Like, I'm offended by that. And I'd rather punch you in the face. <laughs> Excuse the, I'm not saying that it's just, I'm speaking in emotion, not what, what I would actually do. But I found that to be inconsiderate. And it was more about him because he felt awkward and was trying to help the situation. Someone told my wife is another illustration. She's um, she said, would you actually be so self given where you know he is would you be that selfish to ask him and want him to come back the whole like he's in a better place he's or... in a better place yeah <laughs> the answer is yes yeah. yes because this is wrong this is unnatural this is out of line like a parent doesn't bury a child the right. child buries the parent and all that kind of stuff right so um the answer to her question is like, yes, because it's unjust. It's unjust. Yeah. It's not so, right. So this is just probably like a for all the pastors and me personal question. If sure. you're like in a situation where uh, uh, there is this unnatural flow to life, something tragic and evil happens, mm -hmm. how would you deliver a eulogy or a funeral speech? I actually have changed those things a little bit, even when it's not a when it's not a tragedy of like out of sequence. Like so even with the person, I actually cite there's Ecclesiastes. There's a time to to celebrate, but there's also a time to mourn. Yeah. And God is okay with that. And I try to stress in those eulogies, cast your cares on Jesus. Right. It's okay to hurt right now. Yes, we have a hope, but the God that we serve is big enough and compassionate enough to also love us through the grief and not feel like we have to be good servants of God and leapfrog all the pain. Yeah. Because that's actually just going to be religious. Right. So expressively that's the some of the things that i try to include these days when i'm when i've done funerals yeah to i think people want to leapfrog to their resurrection without the the reality of sin and death and the cross i think that that could be a ten a trend yeah like like it what are we actually speaking to if we just kind of leapfrog the reality that this hurts yeah and we go well there's a future hope we get to go somewhere else one day when we die like Christ is going to come and take us out of there, out, out of it all. And like, and so when we leapfrog from the hope, it actually, I believe that it feels less relevant to the world. Right. It doesn't know God to just, because they're looking at it going, what kind of God is this that he doesn't, he, he doesn't even live in reality and neither do his people. Right. And I think God is willing that we, he knows the world we live in. Right. Yeah, and that's the whole gospel. He's, he's he's he entered into this world, experienced the hardship, experienced death, and yeah. is redeeming the world, not just escapism. Yes, yes. You can, your creation is the end goal, and yes. uh, yeah, it's interesting how th theology plays a role. Uh, just kind of, I think a lot of it is just the, this inability that, like you said, like just people are uncomfortable with talking about this topic, and yeah um an awkwardness people just feel like they have to speak and sometimes it's 
the words are probably not useful right now or a hug is what's needed or um, let's solve the problem of evil another time. Let's not deal with that right now as we're grieving and going through right. this hardship. Um, yeah. Because it sucks all the oxygen out of the room. Right. Like it sucks the oxygen out of the conversation. Uh, I, like I'm not trying to make this a, a, a high energy conversation per se, but if, if we were just sitting having a, let's say we're sitting having coffee or a glass of wine together and it's the four of us, you know, there's four people around yeah. our, both our wives and us. And unless you're asking me if all of a sudden I just, we're having a great time. And then all of a sudden it, it becomes a relevant comment that I go, yeah, we lost a son. Yeah. Great time. All the oxygen in the conversation sucked out in a half a second. Right. So all of a sudden you don't know what to say. Right. You know, right. And, and I get that. Um, anybody gets, feels, feels like that. So, there's a time and place for it. Right, yeah. right. One last question. Um, okay. If you would s say one message to the church in America, uh, what, what would it be? Honestly, I would say it would be a little separate from this. Can we get back to making it first about Jesus? And can we stop making so much of this about ourselves? Yeah. Whether it's our worship, whether it's our sermons, I believe that the that that the Bible is first a revelation of God. It's not a meta. It's not a book to be used as a metaphorical self help book. It's about how can we, or it's about how do I know God who revealed Himself in the book. And oh no, woe is me because when I read it and I realize the ways in which I'm not like him, woe unto me. God help me because I'm not like you. That's very different than self-help and metaphors that we hear in a lot of messages, I think, today. And even the worship. Can it, can it, a lot of our songs are no longer to God, they're about God again which has a place. I don't actually think it, it's, it should never be. But I find that um, humanism in the church, I, I feel personally that we have begun to put ourselves first. And um, God is at our beck and call. And in, when, when in reality is, I need to understand him so that I can be like him. And I can't even do that on my own strength. So I need his healing. And the worship is an offering unto him that's about him, that is to him. We had a, a church the other week. I went up to my friend who's the pastor, and there was a moment in the worship, the last song. You could feel that presence. And I went up to the, my friend and I said, did you feel that? Did you notice that dynamic at the last song? And he goes, yeah. I said, that's the presence of God. And he went, oh, because I know, like you've seen, right? You know what will happen what, when, when you make an offering a prayer at that moment. Because people would just, they were, they were at the end of themselves meeting, getting ready. They were available to meet an experience of God. And, and not that he missed it. It's just a dynamic, right? And I wasn't being critical of him, and I'm not trying to be now. These are the things that I'm thinking on lately, no matter what size, big, small, house, whatever, I don't care. I, I, I feel like we've gotten more, more self-centered in our whole approach. And I wish that we'd be able to make some pivots, I guess. Thank you, Rip. What do you think about that? If I may ask, is that okay? Of course, it's a conversation. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, I mean, seek first the kingdom of God, put God first, and then everything falls into place. Uh, makes a lot of sense. I think idolatry is putting anything above that. So oftentimes mm -hmm. that's, that's happening historically, but there's this sort of influx of more of a narcissistic culture with social media, with meism, that's kind of elevated. Um, not like, like, 
everyone's gotten more narcissistic, not full blown mm -hmm. diagnosed narcissist. But I'm talking about self centered because yes. of how we are living, how we're just viewing the world through the lens of technology and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's a real detriment because that's not reality. Um, I think if when you allow God to be God, everything falls into place. And I love what you put about scripture. Uh, it is ultimately about the revelation of Christ. Uh, like my testimony, when I became a Christian, I was in high school and it was John chapter five, when Jesus says, you search the scriptures expecting to find life, but you refuse to come to me for all scriptures about me. And oh. that was like the cheat code for me unlocking the rest of the Bible. It like hit me over the head. I, I completely surrendered right beforehand. And I, like, yeah, the Bible is supposed to get me to the presence, uh, an understanding of who God is. Yeah. And when, when that is there when people are seeking God first, uh, the presence is there. And I think one of the biggest hindrances for the presence of God is just, he hates, the Holy Spirit hates dishonesty mm -hmm. of all sorts, whether it's yeah. not confessing sin, whether it's not being in tune with your emotions, whether it's not um, trying to sugarcoat some religiosity to this current situation, Mm -hmm. I find that the Holy Spirit does never shows up in those environments. He like mm -hmm. is allergic to untruth of all sorts. Yeah. But yeah. when when people are just truthful with everything, uh, that's when good things happen. When the presence of God's there, nothing nothing change. Everything changes for the better because it's His presence that 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 allows it. And that doesn't that, that never happens with if, if people are not putting God as the priority or they're not being honest about it. Yeah, man, that's a good word. That's so good. Uh, yeah. I like. I, I really just appreciate hearing your insights and how you're how you're thinking about it and and how you're seeing things too. You know, yeah. it, um, what a, a lot of wisdom in there, man. Thank you, brother. Thank you for sharing your story and uh, you know addressing uh, this topic that needs to be addressed and also taking your time to get there and uh, an amazing testimony, keeping your family together, serving God together, and. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to end this with some religious platitude. I'm just going <laughs> to just say thank you for writing this. Oh, and, my pleasure. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to the end of the Christ and Coffee podcast. Thank you uh, for listening to the end. Uh, you could pick up a copy of Rip's book. They'll be in the description. Um, and uh, I'll see you next week. God bless. Have a great week. And remember to stay caffeinated, my friends. God bless you. Christ and Coffee.